Hello, my name is Bob Sherman, and before we get started this afternoon, I'd like to thank Edith Blanchard and the McGuire Museum for inviting me to speak this afternoon. I had the very unique opportunity in the 1960s of growing up at the famous Iverson Movie Ranch. It's in Chatsworth, California, about 30 miles northwest of downtown Los Angeles. In the 1970s, I worked for my Uncle Joseph A. Iverson, and in 1980, I had the opportunity of actually purchasing the studio from my Uncle Joe. And uh, let's turn the times of hand back a century or so and talk about the early days of motion picture history. Thomas Edison is considered to be one of the very most important pioneers in the entertainment industry. And one of his early accomplishments was figuring out a method of running film through a movie camera at a consistent rate to actually create motion pictures. Prior to that point in time, most pictures were what we call Nickelodeons, where a series of still photographs were mounted on a round spool, and the user looked in a viewfinder and they just spun a crank, and as the pictures advanced one at a time, it created the sensation of a motion picture. Uh, these movies were generally only a minute or two long and featured something like a couple of bank robbers walking in a bank, some shots fired, they run out with a sack of cash, a posse forms out of nowhere, there's a run off into the sun often the next thing you see is a couple of bank robbers hanging from a tree and the end. Uh, well in 1903 uh, Mr. Edison hired a filmmaker, a pioneer filmmaker called uh, Edwin S. Porter and film historians kind of consider Mr. Porter as the pioneer of what we now know as a narrative filmmaking uh, kind of like the three-act play of Shakespeare with the beginning middle and end storylines and plots to kind of keep the viewer interested. And uh, we're gonna get a couple of facts here. Uh, in 1903, uh, most people consider the very first movie ever made, uh, The Great Train Robbery. And that was uh, directed by Mr. Porter uh, and produced by Mr. Edison. And at that same year, they made a documentary called The Life of a Fireman. And obviously, like the title, it kind of showed New York firemen and how they, you know, respond to fires and everything. It was, uh, they were actually the narrative filmmaking process, like, like I was talking about. Um, an unfortunate fact, uh, almost 75% of all early movies ever made were lost or basically deteriorated. They were filmed on a film stock called Nitrate. <clears throat> and they're very unstable. They didn't last very well. And when they were put in balls uh, years later, they were just like a big glot, nothing really uh, retrievable. So unfortunately, uh, we've lost a great majority of our early films, and that's something that can't be changed. Uh, well, speaking of the Iverson Movie Ranch, uh, what we're going to talk about today, as I said, it's located in Chatsworth. It was the very first outdoor movie studio. Prior to that, there was film shot here and there, but the Iverson Movie Ranch was the first place to actually build a studio with roads and sets and be open for business on a regular basis. And uh, the way that happened, my family, the predecessors, were ranchers in Chatsworth. And one day a guy shows up at the homestead and said, uh, we'd like to use your land for a movie. And of course, my forefather didn't even know what a movie was. Uh, still pretty new concept and the scout explained the process of filming and offered him five dollars a day which was the selling point and thus the Iverson Movie Ranch was formed and many industry firsts happened there as we mentioned here uh, uh, and, and, uh, the, the ranch was home to over 3,000 different movies throughout its history W. Griffith was another one of the early pioneers in filmmaking. He's the one that's kind of uh, really worked with actors a lot, and trying to create more of a realistic uh, emotional response on, on camera. And you know, a, a real pioneer. He made several movies at the Iverson Ranch, as you can see here. Uh, we're going to talk about a few of those this afternoon. One of the early ones was Silent Man, and this movie was 
a, a silent movie, obviously. About the same time, Edison was working on a film uh, sound process called Cantophone, but they hadn't figured out how to amplify the sound. They could record sound, but they couldn't amplify it. So movies were still silent at this era. And in 1918, another major movie was uh, Tiger Man. And we joke a lot of these Indians were actually uh, not Indians. They were just people hired by the studio to uh, be in the movie. And uh, moving along here. Uh, now, 1925 with Rin Tin Tin. And that was a very important movie in the early industry stages. Uh, Warner Brothers was a studio that was actually in financial trouble at the time. And Rin Tin Tin, they made three Rin Tin Tin movies at the ranch at that time. And Rin Tin Tin was very successful and actually bailed the studio out of bankruptcy. Um, and and uh, is considered to, you know, kind of, Rin Tin Tin actually did save the day. So now, as I said, Rin Tin Tin, they made three different movies, and uh, it was directed by Thomas Eintz. And uh, also about the same time, the 1920s, another couple other major movies was Vendetta with Nigel Bruce. And there was uh, Charlie Chaplin made several movies at the ranch at that same time, including Gold Rush, which was one of his kind of big successes. So, 1925, the original Ben-Hur was filmed at the ranch. And in the early days of silent movies, there were a lot of religious movies uh, made, you know, David and Goliath and all kinds of uh, different, different Bible movies. And in 1925, Ben-Hur was filmed there. And there's some pretty interesting facts about Ben-Hur. It was one of the first movies to actually use multiple cameras to film a particular scene. Uh, prior to that, there was one camera and they just shot a, a scene generally High level, uh, uh, we call them on tripod, and, and, uh, and the camera work for Ben Hur was cutting edge at the time. And, uh, it was made by MGM, and an interesting thing: the average price of a movie about this time was around one hundred fifty thousand dollars for production costs on most of these movies that we just discussed. Uh, the budget for Ben Hur was three point nine million took two years to film. And the studio was <laughs> getting pretty worried that uh, this wasn't going to turn into a big bust for him. And the chariot scene, which is famous to everybody, <clears throat> they shot 200,000 feet of film in the chariot scene. And that edited down to 750 feet, which uh, is a lot of stuff on the editing room floor, as they say in the industry. It was starring Francis X. Bushman and Ramon, Ramon Navarro. Um, they were big stars at the time. And it was directed by a European guy named Fred Nibble. And um, it was also one of the first pictures to ever shoot color film. And Max Factor, the makeup artist, that's kind of where he got his start uh, with the techniques that they were using, the makeup styles and stuff that he invented at the time. That was kind of his claim to fame in early, early business. Unfortunately, during the chariot race, there was one stuntman killed and five horses were killed. So it was a pretty, pretty rough deal. Um, and of course, at this point in time, uh, there was very few film agencies. If I remember right, this Motion Picture Academy of Science was uh, 1923, so they were new. SAG, SAG, uh, Screen Actors Guild, didn't actually come about until I think 1932. So there was very few governing bodies to keep people safe on set or by rules and regulations or anything like that. So um, another big Bible movie at the time was Noah's Ark. And uh, that was filmed in 1928. Um, and it employed the map painting process, which was uh, a method of blocking out part of the lens <clears throat> to later accommodate an overlay of another part of the 
a film shot on a different part of the lens, and then they would lay those two together and create a superimposed image of something that really didn't exist. It was pretty uh, innovative filmmaking, and uh, it really changed the way people got to see pictures because uh, a lot of these things that they did this process with would never have been able to have been created on cam in camera. They were also like spe early special effects. Uh, Noah's Ark was about two minute, two hours and eight minutes long. So by, by this point in time, the films had gone from a couple of minute Nickelodeon to full length feature films where the audience uh, sat through, uh, like I say, the three act play where there's a beginning, middle and end and you know, real stories were being told. Um, Noah's Ark star Dolores Costello and, and George O'Brien, they were big stars at the time. And uh, the, the Vitaphone was just coming about at this time. That's a sound recording process, unlike Edison's. And there was actually some sound in this movie. Uh, and that was kind of the beginning of the talkies as we now know. Uh, it was produced by Warner Brothers and the Hungarian director, Michael uh, Curtis was the director. So that's you know, a few interesting facts on um, Noah's Ark. About that time, the famous Al Jolson was one of the first actors, um, and he actually had lines using that Vitaphone. He was one of the first actors that had speaking parts in a motion picture, and uh, that all happened in about 1928. So things were advancing. You think about it, it's been... 20, 25 years at this point of actual film making, and they've gone from just the earliest primitive uh, concepts of you know shooting a picture, things that really developed. Lots of companies were kind of being born at this time, creating support systems like lighting, and uh, Bull Richards is one of the companies that was founded about this time, and the early lights were basically a DC current carbon arc lamps, which is basically a welding rod in front of a curved lens, mirrored, curved mirrored lens that would you know, project the light out wherever you pointed that, that concave lens. And uh, one of the problems with this was the UV or whatever the welding rods gave off actually gave some of the early actors skin cancer <laughs> It's unfortunate, but uh, Mole Richards invented a new new bulb, new light source that uh, was not as dangerous. And these early carbon arc lamps, they were very big and heavy. And the carbon arcs, the carbons themselves would burn down and then the studio lighting guy would have to open the light up and replace that carbon with a new longer one as it would burn down. And these carbons would come out extremely hot, and they were occasionally dropped or discarded, and they started many a fire in the early days in the motion picture business, too. And so, like I say, at this point in time, there was lots of people creating methods and systems and tools of the trade um, and actually starting businesses, many of which are still in business today. So, so what we're going to talk about next is four films in particular that were kind of major pictures that were shot at the Iverson Movie Ranch. And this is Man, Woman, and Bears, Three Ages, Richard the Lionhearted, and Tell It to the Marines. So, uh, Man, Woman, and Marriage was released in 1921. Uh, it was a, a, a major picture. Uh, one of the first movies ever to have a cast of a thousand actors. Uh, we'll see here in a couple of scenes. And the ranch itself had several locations. It was a, about a 2,000 acre studio, uh, with a couple different areas that were just extremely picturesque and unique rock formations, which I should have mentioned previously, is really the reason that the scout picked the movie, uh, the Iverson Ranch, as a site for their particular film because they'd begun a movie in Colorado and were having problems with the weather, so they moved west where the weather was uh, stabler because uh, I should have mentioned this earlier. Most pictures in the early days relied on natural light. Um, and like on the East Coast, the weather was cloudy and dreary a lot of times, and they didn't get the consistent natural light that the West Coast tends to have. And that's one of the main reasons that some movies 
moved to Hollywood because in the San Fernando Valley, if you ever lived there, you would know that it's sunny a lot. Uh, and that sunshine provided consistent lighting for, for movie making along with many other things. Uh, so this, this movie here, um, Man, Woman, and Marriage, it starred Dorothy Phillips and Ramona, R Ramon Navarro. Uh, it was made by First National Pictures, which is no longer in existence. Uh, it had a working title of the Amazonians. Uh, so a lot of times film historians will talk about, the, you know, this being known as the Amazonian, but uh, it was actually released under the name Man, Woman, and Marriage. And, and uh, there was uh, one surviving copy found, but it hasn't been seen by any people in many years because the film stock is so delicate that to run it through a camera would probably destroy it. So uh, it currently is basically unavailable. The movie was about a, a bunch of women with their children and a bunch of men coming to steal their children for, you know, for raising or whatever. It was made by Warner Brothers and people say that uh, the success of Rin Tin Tin financed this, this picture. So, so they started to say this this setting in the background here with those large, unique rock formations, the one kind of taller one in the center, it looks like an Egyptian sphinx, and we call it the Sphinx Rock. Uh, and this area, this set, is called the Garden of the Gods. Uh, and the Garden of the Gods, like I said, was set for just thousands of pictures, uh, several hundred pictures were shot there. And by using props and camera angles and matte paintings and set construction and stuff, they made this look like everything from all around the universe, basically. Uh, so, uh, as I said, there was a thousand people in some of these scenes, in some of these battle scenes. And I always joke, the uh, set medics, because they're all swinging swords and riding horses, as you'll see in this scene. There's a lot of action taking place in that scene um, for a couple of things. You know, there was a lot of people got boo-boos uh, when they were swinging swords around that close to each other or horses and jump around and everything. The charging horse scene here. Um, there's again, the stage rocks kind of pointed out here and they built the walls around the area. Uh, back on the left, there's a flat top rock in the very left frame. That's actually a, a set that was built for an unknown movie in the very early 1900s. And we never figured out what the first movie to build that set was. Um, there wasn't much for record keeping in the early days of film history because I don't know, people just didn't get that advanced yet or something. But they see that little flat rock, that, that cave, that, that it's an actual cave, uh, man-made cave. And that was used in lots of movies Typically, when you film and you build your sets, we call it striking the set. They take everything down when they're done with their picture and have to return the set, the location to the original look. For some reason, that set we call it the fake cave house uh, was just left and used in lots of different films. So um, you see the fake cave house and then the tower rock is a fake looking rock from the other angle and then all the one that snakes rock and the little huts were built. And this whole uh, area in the middle with the, uh, the pillars and everything there was actually created just for this movie. It was a, a, a large movie set. <clears throat> and what was happening at that point in time, uh, you know, originally plays were done on stage inside and set builders could build things that didn't have to withstand high winds and rain and all kinds of stuff. So there was lots of new techniques being innovated to create these sets to where they were durable enough to take the weather. Some of these shows went on for weeks filming them and it could rain, there could be high winds. So the sets had to be built a lot more durable than the previous uh, you know, theater sets. So the set designers and set builders had to kind of up their game a little bit to accommodate the conditions. As you can see, the, the back side of that, uh, what we would be looking at now is that all that wood construction is the back side of the pillars that we were looking at a moment ago. And a little reservoir here was uh, for fire control. Uh, 
the LA Fire Department was actually a pretty big factor at this point in time in Los Angeles, and they watered horses and had fire, had water on hand in case there was a fire. Uh, that wasn't actually in the picture. And uh, you can see there that uh, you know a lot of a lot of construction and everything. Though today that would be significantly different. There'd be this wouldn't pass today's standards for set construction, but at, back at this time, that was still pretty advanced considering what they were doing on, on stage in the theaters prior to that point. This was another action shot where everybody's in there having their little fight and a little close up of the sinks there and, and uh, people on top of the, beating the drum to set the tune. And we, we joke about here, there's a couple of guys, I call them the original party crashers, uh, with two hats right in the foreground there, a couple of uh, just curious onlookers snuck on set and were kind of watching the action. Uh, the background, there was rock to the right there, this kind of in the background of quarter mile or whatever, that's actually part of the Spawn Ranch. Uh, my uncle was friends with Spawn and as the Iverson Ranch developed uh, and was usually full to capacity, he went to his neighbor Spawn and helped him build the Spawn Ranch, which of course became famous with Charlie Manson. And, uh, but that two rock cre the crest back there on the right side of the frame is actually on the Spawn movie ranch. So. Uh, okay, the next movie, we're gonna chit chat about a moment here is Three Ages. This was kind of an interesting story. It's a love story about man, and it goes in the prehistoric caveman era, the Roman era, and the modern era. And the prehistoric portion of the movie was filmed at the Iverson Ranch. As you can see, it was released in 1923 with Buster Keaton, who was a big star. He wrote and produced it. And uh, um, it was distributed by Metro Pictures. And as you can see, the film was you know badly decayed, uh, but it had been somewhat restored. And a major picture in his day, uh, for sure. So many of these sites were used just again and again and again and again, but by making little changes or uh, changing camera angles and stuff, they could film the same place and people wouldn't necessarily recognize those scenes. So the, uh, the one thing about the Iverson Movie Ranch that helped its success, uh, in the early days, SAG uh, created a, a, a deal called the Golden Circle. And the Golden Circle is an area from downtown Hollywood, a 30 mile radius around that area. And as far as union rules, anything inside that Golden Circle had a different set of rules uh, on pay. They didn't have to pay per diem, they didn't have to pay travel expenses, they didn't have to pay for overnight stays and things like that. So it was cheaper to film in the Golden Circle. And the Iverson Movie Ranch was fortunate enough to be inside that Golden Circle. So it allowed film producers, to, who are always budget conscious, to shoot their, their movies and uh, save a little money. Here, uh, this again is another scene from Three Ages. And that's Buster Keaton being drugged by an elephant. And if you notice uh, on the right side of the screen there, the curled, like woolly mammoth, over accentuated curled tusks. Uh, some prop guy just made a set of tusks for that elephant. And, and uh, again, they're just dragging along. This scene has been in Bonanza and Ride and Low Ranger and Virginia and McHale's Navy and you know, hundreds of other movies. But you don't really notice. Uh, because you're usually kind of watching what we call the, the center, the center Jones zone, which is, you know, the action here, the actor in the foreground there. Um, but again, that's a bunch of Keaton being drugged by a big old woolly man. So back in the stone ages. And again, here's the fake cave house with some real cavemen standing in front of it. Uh, they go up and have it inside and they can actually go in and out of that, that uh, fake cave. Another picture that was big in this day, in the early in 1923, was Richard the Lionheart. And uh, uh, as you can see there, the, the stars and allied producers, I don't believe 
movies in business today. It was a sequel to the Robin Hood movie with Douglas Fairbanks. And, uh, you know, Robin Hood was a, another very successful movie. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the interesting facts on uh, Richard the Lionheart. Again, this was an example of matte painting. And you'll notice off on the right there, uh, right center, that's the Sphinx Rock. This once again being shot in the Garden of the Gods. And uh, again, early matte painting. Uh, you can see some production guys working down there in a little ladder rig and stuff where the set, set dressers are doing some, some uh, painting or whatever they're doing there <clears throat> in, that, in that scene. But the next frame will show you. That's what the set actually looked like if you were standing in front of the Garden of God. None of that top stuff's on there. It's just an archway between the Sphinx Rock and the Tower Rock being shot uh, from the Garden of the Gods. You can see there the Tower Rock and the Sphinx Rock and, and the little archway between the two rocks was built just like in the Amazonians or Man, Woman, and Marriage where they built the big palace-looking pillars in front of, between the two rock formations, uh, the average viewer would never realize that those two films were shot at the same location. And uh, uh, just a, a fact, uh, we donated this area uh, to uh, the Santa Monica Mountain Park Conservancy. It's a, kind of a park, park preservation foundation in Los Angeles. They have a lot of land. We donated about 40 acres to them, including this area, because of its significant film history. And uh, just an area that uh, was very beautiful, still is, it's there today. People can go and hang out there. The little oak tree that you see inside the bottom of the purple circle, which is about 15, 20 feet, 15 feet tall there, now is taller than the rock itself. So it kind of covers up the rock a little bit, not as easy to see. <clears throat> but for the most part, it looks exactly the same today as the trees are growing. And, uh, another picture of some super, now this is what it actually looks like today. I guess the tree's not quite as tall as I said it is. But plus that picture probably 10 years old. Uh, but uh, you know, for the most part, it looks just like it did a century ago. And, And uh, that's part of the park now. We also donated uh, another part of the ranch, about 700 acres, called Devil's Canyon, which was a real rustic uh, kind of a canyon area, a little river running through it and everything. Just some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful territory. And we donated that to the Conservancy as well, and then they preserve those areas for, you know, forever. Uh, as you can see here, you know, that's a pretty elaborate set, and, you know, it's the viewers in the 20s, you know, these, these, these pictures had to be just astounding to the people to come in and actually see these things because you know, it was just a, just a couple of decades before that, there wasn't such a thing as a motion picture. And uh, you know, it, it had to be an interesting time for, for the viewers and people to really enjoy these, these projects and these, the product that was made by these early filmmakers. Today we're so sophisticated, and, and uh, it's really kind of hard for filmmakers today to create believable sets like these guys had to do back in the day. You really got to be an innovator <clears throat> to keep the interest and the excitement of moviegoers uh, in today's world. So, uh, yeah, okay, as you can see, that's the original. That's kind of the line. What's real? What's not real? Richard Goyard. Another major picture at the time, about the same time, 1926, was Tell to the Marines. And uh, that's a story about a young soldier and the sergeant that trained him ready for war. <clears throat> and uh, Lon Chaney was a big star in those days. And uh, Metropolitan Mayor is still around today. He's one of the early pictures. See, you know, it's a very successful picture and it's still available today. Now, they did a lot of set building on this picture as well. Uh, and again, that's the Garden of the Gods from a different angle. You see kind of just the top center 
the six rock and the, and the round rock right up there, and then in that area across the bridge, that's where like the Amazonians had their battle seat and everything. And this uh, rock that uh, the soldiers are on over here is uh, we call that area between the two areas Steep Canyon. And off to the right, just a little bit, a couple of blocks, was the rock where the Lone Ranger reared up on his horse and hiled silver away and, and ran around off into the sunset. That location is just to the right, of, like I say, a couple of blocks. And uh, then on the bottom right of the screen, you can't see, but if you were way off to the right, looking back to, to, the, to this scene, you would see an area we call locomotive rocks, and it looks like a bunch of big old train cars or something. Very, very picturesque rock formation that was filmed in, in just countless numbers of movies. Basically, everything these guys are standing on here was is set construction. I'll show you here in the next frame. Okay, uh, all of this was these big boulders were actually built spanning that canyon. Uh, it's pretty interesting the way they did it here. Uh, that canyon is not near as deep as it is. It's just all kind of trick photography, as they say. And you know, this is supposed to be China. Here it is in Chatsworth, California. <coughs> and the bridge is spanning, you know, fake rocks. Uh, and I'll show you another picture of that same thing here. That's what it actually looked like. Uh, you see a set worker right down here at the bottom doing something. And you notice the, right at the left frame, there's the wood tower uh, where they built a, like a camera pedestal. And uh, I'll tell you what, it had to be a little hairy being on top of that thing because uh, <laughs> you know, the way they, they built that stuff. But again, this inside the circle, that's all set building rocks, and uh, as well as on the left side, too. Uh, and, uh, you can see, you know, these guys were just kind of marching off in onto that, that bridge. You can see people on the other side as they're charging through. All the rocks across in the back side of the frame, that's all actual territory. As I said, you know, garden rocks right in the center of the frame there. You know, a couple of interesting shots. You see these pillars, these braces. All they do is chip in the rock a little bit and put those anchors in there. I mean, today there'd be like safety code violations for forever on that. <laughs> You'd be shut down in a bit. Uh, but you know, again, in those days there wasn't a whole lot of uh, you know requirements and regulations that developed in the industry yet, and accidents and things like that kind of brought about the need for a lot of these uh, safety procedures. But uh, that point, back to that little chip of the rock is still there today. You, you know where to look. You can go up there and see where that brace was actually mounted. And, uh, you know, we, you know, having lived there, I know where a lot of these things are. And, you know, like to take people kind of around and show different things where there's hundreds of those kind of things where some movie of the past was filmed and they did something that, uh, you know, left a little bit of a footprint behind for future generations to discover. Again, just another shot of uh, what was, uh, you know, kind of how they built that, that scene, uh, you might say. And I say this is kind of, you know, cinematography in its infancy where you know, man was figuring out ways of creating images that were appealing to the viewers. I published a book on the history of the ranch. If anyone's interested in it, it's available on amazon.com. Book on the right, quiet on the set, history of the Irish Ranch. And that's me and my Uncle Joe. Uh, we were cowboys in that picture. Uh, Joe was a uh, kind of an interesting person. Uh, like I said, they were just a working cattle ranch outside of Los Angeles in the, well, I think, 1896. And he went to fourth grade in the Chatsworth School, and then, you know, for duty call, and he just worked in the family ranch, and then uh, 18, whatever, he went to World War One, and he served as a sniper in Germany, and 
as he said, he saw the same bullet twice, once when it went past him and once when he went past it. So, uh, but uh, he, was a, he was a character and, you know, real kind of a hillbilly. But in this picture, he's in his duds, but he was uh, actually a world traveler. And the Randolph Hearst invited him up all the time. My uncle was a big game hunter, kind of famous. He'd hunt with John Wayne and Bing Crosby all around the world. He had several trophies of uh, record book caliber. And, you know, like in India, they stay with the Maharishi. And, and uh, because of the movie Ranch, it opened the doors for him to go. Whenever they traveled around the world, they were always dignitaries and taken to you know, all the you know, social high points and everything. And uh, I have to say, in my life, I've been kind of enjoyed the same opportunities because I owned the Iverson Movie Ranch and was involved in hundreds of films. Uh, whenever I got to travel, I was always kind of uh, allowed the fortune of going places and seeing and doing things that most people never would get to because you know, the film industry is a real door opener for a lot of opportunities like that. But Joe is a great guy and uh, kind of a, 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 like I say, very, very interesting guy <clears throat> having very little education, but he saw an opportunity. Uh, one little quick story, when he came back from World War One, he was a sniper, as I said, because he grew up, you know, they hunted for their food in them days. Shot a squirrel, he went hungry. <laughs> and uh, in the early movies, they didn't have blanks and all that stuff. And he was hired as a sharpshooter in some of these early movies to actually shoot live rounds near the actors to get the little ricochets and stuff like that. Uh, of course, it wasn't too long before they quit that practice, but uh, he always told those stories about shooting at the actors. So, uh, Anyway, I'd like to thank Dennis Liff, who's a friend of mine and a film historian, and he's done lots of research on early days at the Iverson Movie Ranch as well as other places. Dennis has a pretty informative blog called the Iverson Movie Ranch Blog. Um, you can look that up on the internet. And my friend Charlotte DiCamillo helped me put this presentation together. I'd like to thank her. And I'd like to thank you all for sticking through this, hopefully. And enjoying these facts and, and uh, hopefully you learned a little something and uh, we just want to say thank you and we'll end. Uh, using, uh, being used for film production? Uh, okay. The question was, is the Iverson Ranch still working today? And that's partially yes. The areas that we donated to the Conservancy are available for filming. Uh, and then some of the ranch itself, uh, uh, I had a 30 acre kind of estate around the house. Uh, I sold that to a, a friend and for the most part, they don't do any filming there. Uh, but parts of the Iverson Ranch are still available filming yes and then there have been railroad tracks built through there and freeways built through there and uh, I don't know a thousand condos have been built on part of it and uh, you know those are all available for filming dealing with people other than you know, Diamond Ranch. So. Uh, a lot of commercials are still mm. filmed there. Commercials in the last 20 years were kind of a lot of the mainstay of the, the ranch. Uh, even in my tenure, I did I don't know how many commercials, <laughs> 100 of them or something. <clears throat> uh, because like Jeep commercials, car commercials, things like that, they like to have a little open road with some terrain and everything. Uh, we do toy commercials from Mattel and things like that. They have their little toy spacemen flying around the rocks and whatever. Television, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, we did a fair amount of TV shows where uh, I had one of the only private overpasses, uh, the freeway, the 118 Seepy Valley Freeway dissected the ranch, and I had a private overpass that crossed the freeway, so when you see a scene where, you know, somebody was up on a freeway overpass, you know, eh, commit a crime or whatever it was they were going to do, that was, could have been filmed at my place. And uh, then it had, you know, just a super duper 
panoramic view of the city of Los Angeles, you know, up on those hills, um, Los Angeles, the city laid right below there, and you could be up on the hill and have a shot of you know, millions of lights out there overlooking the city. So it was always a great, uh, we call it inserts and pickup shots, because they didn't necessarily shoot a whole movie there, they just come out for a scene where somebody would be driving down the road, they'd pull over, and get out and be standing in front of the car talking with the city vista in the background. Um, and maybe it was a, a day's work, they'd have a few lines and get in the car and drive off. So we did a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, Jungle Book, one of the last big movies I did there, uh, where we had everything from turtles to giraffes. I mean, it was amazing working with lions and tigers and gorillas. And <laughs> Bull frogs and everything, <laughs> and a lot of animals in that picture. And typically, uh, uh, oh, you know, a lot of crime stories where you know there's always that kind of little hideout type thing where <clears throat> you know people sneak out of out of the city. Actually, it was, uh, and that number's been kind of. Never really completely verified it, but I would say about 2,000 acres. Uh, I don't think it was actually quite that much because uh, my uncle had kind of arrangements with a few of his neighbors to use some of their land. Uh, so the ranch itself maybe encompassed more than he actually owned, but it was a large spread. Uh, we had around 20 miles of roadway on the ranch itself. Uh, it might be something as simple as there's a, a, a hill and the road goes around this way and down that way and off this way and then movies would shoot from this angle and they'd come around the bend this way and then they'd shoot the same spot from the other angle and they'd come around from a different direction and look like two different places. So sometimes like a Jeep chase or a horse chase. We did a lot of the, uh, all those old movies uh, in the 80s, like, you know, Six Million Dollar Man and stuff where they had a lot of, you know, Dukes of Hazard and stuff where they go out and have the car chases. And a lot of those times they only cover a couple of blocks, but it looked like they were all over the countryside. You know, but they just, by changing camera angles and maybe throw a few limbs in here and there, uh, they could make it look like it was a long chase. Actually, two things I've got going at this point in time. One is I've started the Midwest Film School. Uh, we're meeting at the SURF in Clear Lake currently, and uh, we're teaching filmmaking, the process, the art of it, uh, from A to Z, uh, how to write a movie, how to shoot a movie, how to post a movie, how to distribute a movie. Uh, and also, the main thing we're doing is we're trying to bring production to Iowa, um, from California or anywhere else for that matter. And we've got several pictures that uh, we're in the process of putting together to be filmed in Iowa to, uh, in the upcoming year or whatever. And uh, so that's been pretty exciting because, you know, Iowa has a lot of unique geographic op um, offerings. We, you know, we have picturesque scenery and, and a lot of uh, pictures can be kind of very well, you know, shot here uh, very effectively. There's not much of an infrastructure, uh, which is kind of one of the downsides, and that's what I'm working on. I happen to own a, a lighting company uh, still, and so I have all the equipment to make movies, and you know, we're developing some talent, and hopefully through the film school, we can build some crews and people that are interested in making movies, and we can all work together, and and start a little film industry right here in North Central Iowa. So that's that's a big part of the plan right now is uh, is to, you know, California has been filmed, you know, tens of thousands of movies have been made there. So the, the different scenery is kind of refreshing. So we think we're gonna do well in the next couple of years.